All right, guys. <clears throat> Monday, week seven. Uh, I hope you had a restful weekend. Uh, today, it's, it's pretty exciting. It's extra exciting uh, because we're going to move into a new section uh, for our course, and we're going to go into improving performance. Uh, per usual, before that, I'm going to give you some feedback about what you submitted um, last night and what you have to submit by Sunday. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and go right here. Excellent. So we're into October right here. Before that, um, I have my notes in front of me. Hello, 10, uh, the mean score, the average score was 82%. Hello, 11, 86%. I don't have any specific items that I should just make a comment. However, I'm gonna make the same comment I made last week and then two weeks before, uh, before today and then three weeks and so on and so forth, which is do not rush it. Take your time. All the answers are in the slideshows, everything, okay? Now, concerning L uh, learning games, LG 10, 88%, we're getting better in LG 11, 96%, okay? One comment here, the same people who didn't do that well in LG 11 are most likely the same people who didn't do well um, in LG 10. So take your time, guys. Take your time. Again, do not rush it. Uh, you are making some silly mistakes and you shouldn't. You shouldn't, okay? So I know you can do better. I know you've been doing great, but obviously I'm going to try to push you as much as possible so you can reach your potential, okay? So that's it concerning feedback. Now for this week, as I already said, we're going into uh, improvement performance. We're starting with two chapters. Uh, this section is until chapter 17, if I'm not, if I'm not uh, mistaken. Uh, and um, we're going to talk with uh, PST, Introduction to Psychological Skills Training today, and we're also going to cover arousal. Uh, you also uh, have um, which is pretty common, two LOs and two learning games, one for each chapter due on Sunday. Cool? All right, so I'm gonna stop sharing this and I'm gonna start sharing the PowerPoint slideshow if I find it. Uh, let me see. Yeah, that's 12. Uh, per usual, again, I'm not going to um, cover everything, just the most important things or the things that may confuse you if you try um, to go over them by yourselves. All right. So I hope you can see it. Move this, go into a full screen. There we go. Introduction to psychological skills training, right? And um, I wanna ask you how many times you've seen athletes or even your own personal experience uh, attribute their poor performance uh, to factors such as, you know, uh, losing uh, concentration or tighten, uh, tightening up under pressure. So in, in a few words, they're, they, they are bringing up the mental side uh, of their game. Um, yet a mistake that coaches and athletes um, alike commonly make is to attempt to correct performance uh, by uh, simply adding more practice time. So uh, a lack of physical skills usually though is not the problem. The real problem is a lack of mental skills. So that's what we're gonna to try to cover today. And the very first thing is 
as we usually do is to talk about some definitions. So this is important, I want you to know that. PST, and that stands for Psychological Skills Training, right? And as you can see, it's a systematic, systematic and consistent. And we're gonna talk about both of those characteristics. Practice of mental or psychological skills for what purpose? For the purpose of enhancing performance, increasing enjoyment or achieving greater self-satisfaction. Satisfaction. Um, PSD has major effects on performance and we're gonna cover that in a little bit. Okay, all right. All right, so why is this important? Why is this important? And actually I'm gonna give a lecture next month about this specific topic, right? This is very introductory, but it's so basic, it is. By basic, I mean, it's so important, it's crucial. It's like the cornerstone of any kind of intervention that affects performance. So we know that athletes feel that those factors, the psychological factors account from some kind of day-to-day -day fluctuations in performance, All right? However, as I already mentioned, we don't spend enough time on working on those psychological factors or on those skills that affect us and psychological factors that in turn affect our performance. Um, you know, my specialty is mental toughness. I'm not gonna cover mental toughness today. But in general, you need to know that uh, it is the ability of a sports person, right, um, to um, respond in a way in the face of adversity. And a lot of times I get that question, like, what is adversity? Adversity is a situation or um, a number of factors that take you out of, of um, the environment that you could thrive and uh, puts in danger your, um, in, in terms of performance, your optimal performance, anything. That could be, you know, a very important game, an injury, pressure from the media, whatever, anything, anything, adversity, anything. It can be a life-changing event, like a death in the family, uh, right? Or, or, or something simple, anything that you didn't bring your favorite socks in the game, that's kind of adversity. For you. So however you respond to, so respond to that, uh, has to do with your, that ability has to do with what we call mental toughness. I'm not gonna cover mental toughness, we will need a lot of time, but that's enough for now. Um, there are things that happen in our life and can build mental toughness, right? Assuming that you're one of those people that think that mental toughness can be taught, it is not, uh, and in an ability, a trait, but it's a state, okay? Um, and there are things that we can actually talk uh, on purpose. So in specific goals, put you under pressure and so on and so forth. There is a dark side of mental toughness. And um, I'll give you an example that's not in the book. For example, if you have really high levels, right? Uh, there is a possibility that you get injured, injured or re-injured more, or it affects your rehabilitation in a negative way because you think you know you're different, you can play injured, you don't want to stop, you don't want to say events. And when you are injured, you're like coach put me in, you know. I'm okay, doc, I'm okay, I don't feel any pain. And that's a, 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 an example, a great example of having too much mental toughness. So a lot of times we talk about really low levels of MT of mental toughness, but also we need to talk about really high levels of mental toughness. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm a little bit, I don't know what's wrong. Hopefully I don't get sick. Nobody has time for that. <laughs> Uh, why are, since, so if we all agree that psychological skills are important and affect performance, 
why do we neglect them? And I've done a lot of research on that, uh, more specifically about mental toughness, but it's pretty much the same. We don't have the knowledge as coaches a lot of times. We don't feel comfortable. We may think, oh, what if we get sued? You know, what if we were, we were another case of negligence if we do something wrong? We don't understand it. We don't think it can be learned, of course. And lack of time is another classic example, especially in NCAA, you know, where the coaches have a specific amount of time. And based on that, and then if you feel that you don't know how to do it or uh, you don't know enough, you wouldn't spend a lot of time uh, trying to do something that you don't know when you don't have a lot of time anyway, okay? Myths about PST. Um, is for problem athletes only. No, no, it's not. No, it's not. Especially if we see it from a positive psychology perspective, right? You work on something, right, without having a problem. You work on something that can help you improve performance. It's not that you can have, that you only work on your psyche if you have an issue, right? That's not right. Especially about like mental toughness, it's a, it's a positive psychology construct. Okay, and if, you, if you're interested into that, look into Seligman uh, and others that talk about positive psychology. What is that positive psychology? It's not only for elite athletes, and that's another issue. We only thought, you know, uh, psychologists or mental coaches or however you want to call them, psychology, sports psychology consultants are for elite. No, it's not. No, it's not. Anybody can benefit from that. It's definitely not a quick fix solution because let's say you have an issue and you're not strong enough. Like we're gonna, are you gonna go to the gym just once? Heck no, right? So this is something that takes time. We said it's a systematic approach, right? That's what we said in the very beginning and it has to be consistent. And of course, PSD is not usual. That's, that's definitely why we have an abundance of evidence um, and we do know that PSD interventions work, okay? Almost in time. Um, uh, psychological skills can be learned, definitely. And we'll see that, but they need to be practiced. They need to be practiced during practice, during the game, game time, but also throughout the day, if possible, okay? What do we know about PSD so far? We know that elite athletes uh, show that they that, that in general we know that the more successful athletes right, have all this higher self confidence, greater self regulation, better communication, more more positive thoughts, more determination or commitment. Which again, it, all these are part of the mental uh, aspect of the game. Um, and this, uh, this is what athletes and coaches have identified as most useful, right? Is it effective? Yes, it is. Yes, it is, definitely. And we're gonna show exactly how it's been done in a little bit. However, you see it has to be individualized and systematic over time and multimodal. We'll talk about multimodal in a little bit. In general, this is something I wanna stop here for a little bit. We have three phases, right? Of PSC, we have the education phase, the acquisition phase, and the practice phase. What is all that? Let's see. Education phase. In the beginning, and I see it all the time, and a lot of times, <laughs> uh, as a mental coach, as a sports psychology consultant, you need to spend a lot of time here because you need to persuade, in a way, the participant that that skill needs to be taught and can be taught, and needs to be learned, and can be learned, right? Excuse me, and the, the second dot has to do with a specific way to do it. You know, you have the athlete to understand, uh, have awareness, we'll talk about awareness, is really important in general, especially in psychology, right? You need to know where you stand. So they, they, they put like, uh, they have like the like red light or whatever the light kind of um, system here. And if it's green, there's flow, you don't even think about it, you know, yellow, you have to think about the skills, you know, and then red, we have an issue and we need to teach something new or re relearn something. 
But in general, education phase has to do with uh, making the participant, the patient, the athlete, how the, like how we, the patron, however you want to call them, you know, recognize that acquiring PST is important. And it is important because those skills affect performance. Once we're done with that, we go to the acquisition phase, which is what? We're, we're trying to figure out what specific individualized strategies and techniques can help this person get those psychological skills that will affect their performance. Okay, so we have general information, but also have that individualized information. And at the end, we need to practice, 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 practice. What's important for me in order to uh, work on my areas of improvement. And here, my goal, of course, is to automate those skills, right? To overlearning, that's one. Second is integrating psychological skills. And the third one is simulate the skills you want to apply to actual competitions. Of course, uh, these kind of skills are not just important for performance that has to do with sport. You see a ton of other people, right? But here now we're not talking about athletes. We're talking about tactical personnel. And we'll also talk about, you see, physicians and dancers and astronauts. So here we go a little bit, we leave sport psychology and we, we go to something that's called performance psychology. So by performance psychology, we mean clients, patrons that don't really have to do support. So a physician, helping a physician, helping a nurse, right, to face a, adversity and increase their performance, uh, that would be under performance psychology. I just want you to remember that. Another great question that I get, what's the ultimate goal of PST? Well, you know, in our class, a lot of you will become coaches. Uh, others will become uh, physiotherapists or um, athletic trainers, sports nutritionists, right? What's your goal? Your goal is eventually to teach the other person something up to the point that they don't need us anymore, right? So in the beginning, they will need us more and more and more, right? To do what? Monitor in the very beginning and then manage. In our case, thought, feelings, and behaviors. Later, later, that will become less and less and less up to the point that they can do that regulation by themselves, AKA self-regulation. That's it, okay? That's the ultimate goal of PST. And this is the five step that we usually, uh, I, uh, you, we usually um, for educational purposes um, use to teach it, it's easier. So we have the identification of the problem, of course, commit that we are gonna do what we need to do. Actually try to execute what we need to execute to fix our problem. And then in stage four, we have some personal and social environmental issues like coaches or family members that we need to address. And at the very end, we have the generalization, which is the execution in other settings. Right, with other people when it really matters, no, not, not from practice, we're going to games. And so we generalize whatever we learned and we execute it in other settings uh, with different teams um, and so on and so forth. That's what it is. Okay. A lot of advantage, uh, advances in technology that helps in the sports psychology, uh, virtual reality, VR is huge. Look it up, look what happens with NFL and VR, right? That's huge. Eye tracking, amazing. Um, some questions and answers that usually help uh, uh, people when I teach the class. Cool. Most likely sports psychologists, uh, can a coach do it? Yes, if they're trained. Or some of it, if they're trained. That's, that's the most accurate answer. When? Off-season is better to do the basic, right? Because you have more time. But then again, when you talk about NCW, you have other issues, you have to train the, the certain conditioning codes, which is another issue. How long, it really depends, right? 
but a generic answer would be 10 to 15 minutes per day, pretty much every day, five days a week. <clears throat> when is the best time to engage in time, pretty much? Um, yeah, uh, this is pretty self-explanatory. First of all, you come to me, I discuss my approach in general. This is what I can do to you in general. And then if you agree, then well, I'm gonna assess your mental skills. I'm gonna find your strengths and your areas of improvement. Since I find your areas of improvement, then we're gonna see how we can uh, create those skills that can attack your areas of improvement and make them strengths, right? And then uh, design something that is individualized for you, just for you nothing else. And then I, uh, after you uh, execute it, I, I, I shouldn't forget to evaluate the program and see if it actually worked. So if I had some kind of measurement here, I would usually do another measurement here. So pre-intervention and post-intervention and see if it went up. And if it was enough or it went down or whatever we're trying to do. Mm. Yeah, nothing really here. Common problems, uh, lack of conviction. It means the coach doesn't believe in it, so they stop sending you to me. Or the actual athlete doesn't believe in it and stops doing what they're supposed to do. So here, this is a big issue in sports psychology as well. We talked about it here and see in physical training, but it's very, very similar. Lack of time, definitely, we talked about that. The, the sports psychologist, the mental coach, has to know specifics about the sport, right? So if a golfer comes to me and I don't know anything about golf, it's really hard. It's really hard. I can do the assessment, I can explain what I can do, but then when I need to individualize something and create um, a customized, plan it's hard because i don't understand the game so no matter how much how well you explain it to me and what's your issue i may not be able to get it and then i may not be able to provide a specialized solution to your issues to your barriers okay and lack of follow-up is of course another thing um i'm going to stop sharing this that was the first chapter of our um first uh, that was the first chapter of the, this section. I'm gonna share now, and we're gonna talk about arousal regulation. All right, um, here we go. Second and last chapter for today, arousal regulation. So we're gonna talk about stress management as well in here, right? So we'll leave, uh, we live in a world where stress has become an integral part in our daily lives and the pressure to perform at high levels, especially in competitive sports, has also increased in recent years. So our society values winning at success and because that's expected, coaches and athletes feel the pressure a lot, a lot of pressure, actually, to be successful. And let me give you uh, a couple of quotes from very uh, famous athletes. I have my notes right here. So Pey Peyton Manning, right? Oh, of course, uh, Super Bowl champion and quarterback. He said, pressure is something you feel when you don't know what the hell you're doing. And then Steph Curry, and be a champion. He said, I'm not the guy who's afraid of failure. I like to take risks, take the big shot and all that. So there's some efforts that may respond well under pressure. Some others may not respond well under pressure. So uh, there's a difference in the response. Uh, the sport is also critical in the way they're gonna react. And we're gonna talk about that uh, as well. So, we need to regulate arousal. So when there's stress, 
we can be over aroused, we can also be under aroused. That's another issue, right? And I explained that different situations and different people may uh, respond differently to that stress. However, it needs to be regulated. And let's see why. Before we regulate anything in psychology, we need to be aware. We talked about that already. Um, so self-awareness is important. You need to understand where you stand at any point of time. Because if you do that, then, then that's the first step uh, before you can actually control those thoughts and those feelings. Optimal arousal, and there are many, many theories about it. Um, like it's a point, um, it's a range, and it really depends. However, we need to know where we stand before we find our optimal arousal and regulate ourselves to reach that point or that range. Oh, and the last one. That's, and we're gonna talk about coping at the very end. I'll read it slowly and maybe a couple of times so you get, you, I'm sure, make sure you get it. How individuals cope with anxiety is more important than how much anxiety they experience. Let me go over it again. How individuals cope with anxiety is more important than how much anxiety they experience. Uh, a great uh, quote that will definitely make sense uh, and relates to what I just read, Zach Donahue, basketball quotes. It's not a case of getting rid of the butterflies. It's a question of getting them to fly in Information. So pretty much he says that um, you can avoid it. <clears throat> and it's not about avoiding it. It's about controlling it and make it work in your favor. So we have somatic anxiety and we'll have cognitive, and cognitive anxiety. We can have both. Somatic anxiety, an example, is your heart rate is going up or you feel uh, your muscles tightening you up. Right, cognitive anxiety is those thoughts that you have. Okay. So what we're gonna talk about, I'm gonna skip some slides, of course, but what we're gonna talk about is you need a specific solution for your specific issue. Now, if you have somatic anxiety, you usually go with something that has to do with it's more physiological. Okay, so you see here progressive relaxation and in class a lot of times you actually do exercise like that, right? Um, so you're trying to relax your muscles progressively. Breath control, that's another one that can affect the physiological responses of somatic anxiety. Biofeedback is awesome. Of course you can wear watch or some, or imagine you can feel and changes, the physiological changes that happen in your body, right? Well, you can see them before you even feel them. For example, we we'll have specific, uh, a specific example would be, um, imagine you were a cup and you can see your theta waves going up or down or your alpha waves going up and down. And based on that, somebody has taught you to do something to control your arousal. Those are great videos, you can watch them. Um, this is cognitive anxiety. So here, it's more about thoughts, okay? So you see uh, meditation is really important. Uh, that warmth and heaviness, that's autogenic training that we sometimes do in class. Um, systematic desensitization, uh, we, trying to manipulate the intensity of the stimuli. So slowly, you know, we are getting desensitized towards that when it happens. Now, really quickly, we'll have SMT, stress management training, and we'll have the cost effective, co cognitive effective, which is as you see, teaching a person specific coping responses. And again, we're gonna talk about coping in a second. And then we have SIT, stress manipulation training, which is you're getting exposed in increasing amounts until you get used to it. Something similar to um, when we talk about physical training, um, 
what's the word I'm looking for? Oh, now, can't even remember it. Progressive overload. Got it. I'm a little bit tired too, so <laughs> well, we're gonna get there. Progressive overload. So you slowly you you uh, manipulate the stress, so you get used to it, and then you can um, you can function a little bit more, and then a little bit more, and then a little bit more until the amount you want to reach. <clears throat> Nothing really uh, crazy here. No. Pressure training. Expose others to pressure in practice. Have you ever uh, used noise in practice, for example, by right? trying to imitate the conditions during a game? That's pressure training. Hypnosis. Um, I'm not going to explain a lot. It's an altered state of consciousness, though. Remember that. That can be induced by a procedure in which a person is in an unusually relaxed state and responds to suggestions designed to alter perceptions, feelings, thoughts, and actions. And I, wanna, I want you to see uh, there in the phases, which is the induction phase, the hypnotic phase, right, where you actually do the intervention, whatever you're doing, then you wake them up, and then the post-hypnotic phase is to see if it actually worked and if they have changed whatever that you were trying to alter. Okay. Um, multimodal process seems to be most effective. However, we have the matching hypothesis, which says it's a hypothesis, which says that uh, an anxiety management technique should be matched to a particular problem. So, if you have Somatic anxiety, you need to do something about that. If you have cognitive anxiety, you have to do some kind of relaxation that has to do with cognitive anxiety. Okay? So as you can see, cognitive anxiety should be treated with mental relaxation. Somatic anxiety should be treated with physical relaxation. When I'm sure, use both. Okay? And a lot of times, it's not a clear cut. It's not just cognitive or just somatic. Coping, a term that's very popular and there's a lot of research concerning coping and psychology. What is it? Is it? It's a process of constantly changing cognitive and behavioral efforts. Why? To manage specific external or eternal demands or conflicts appraised as taxing or exceeding one's resources. Okay, so you cope with something that is challenging. Right, and how do you do that? You change your cognitive and behavioral efforts to match whatever you need to match, whatever is happening. Now, another thing I want you to focus and remember because it's, it's, I think it's something useful in general, right? Um, we have problem-focused coping and emotion-focused coping. What's the difference? Well. We use them in different situations. When there's something that we can change, right, about the problem that we are having, right? So we need more players, we need better players, we need more balls, we need whatever we need to, to attack an issue that we may have that day. We need more sleep, we need better uh, nutrition, whatever, whatever we need, and we can actually alter that Right, we're going towards problem focused coping. If we cannot change it, let's say it has to do with the opponents or the weather or something that's done already, and we can go back in the past, of course, then we use a focus focused coping, which is what? How we respond to that stress. And so it has to do with the perception of what we think the problem is, and we're trying to, we can't change the problem anymore. So we should better try to find a way to deal with it or cope with it, right? Problem-focused coping, emotion-focused coping, both of them important, but for uh, different reasons. Nothing really here as we're going towards the end of this chapter as well. 
There's no single coping strategy that's effective in all situations, not learning a diverse set of problem and emotion focused coping strategies, gender aids, pupil status can influence. Coping appears to be situation specific and there are great individual difference as pretty much everything in psychology. Resilience. Another thing you should know, another term, psychological term. Uh, I don't care to cover the specifics of the definition right now, just remember uh, the phrase bounce back from adversity. And we already explained what adversity is. Bounce back from adversity. Something happens and you bounce back. That's resilience, okay? And that's important to have. And we usually try to have more or higher levels, higher levels of resilience. <clears throat> Nothing really here. Oh, uh, another thing that I mentioned, that's probably the last thing I'm going to mention for today or tonight, um, is that there is a thing called under arousal. So not only over arousal is bad, under arousal is bad as well. So you see that when you move slowly, uh, your mind is wandering, you get distracted, lack of course, lack of anticipation or enthusiasm, and there's that heavy feeling in legs. So you're trying to, again, reach your optimal level of arousal. So when you're over it, you go down, and you're, you're under it, you try to go up, right? So you try to raise it. So you can raise it intensively if you just change your breathing rate, you act energized by yourself, like, oh yeah, good. Well, you know, you've done it in the past, you just act energized. But that actually helps you get energized. Use mood, like, mood words and positive statements, you're shouting, you're yelling, you like right or, or other are doing it for you you're listening to your favorite music that pumps you up right you're thinking about things that are energize you or you have a specific pre-competition routine before you actually compete and pep talks okay so i'm gonna stop sharing uh that's it we covered the chapters we covered what you what you submitted um yesterday and we covered what you need to submit by Sunday. Tomorrow, guess what? Office hours from 8 to 12.30. In the meantime, lift intentionally, not habitually.